Welcome back to the 35th Singapore Economic Roundtable. We will now proceed to the panel discussion. To our online audience, please submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A panel that appears at the bottom of your screen. Our panel today comprises of industry experts and professionals who have joined us to discuss the underlying philosophies and guiding principles of Singapore's fiscal policies. The moderator of this panel is Professor Danny Kwa, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He will open the panel discussion and introduce the speakers. Prof Kwa, over to you. Thank you, Christopher. And again, welcome everyone back to the 35th Singapore Economic Roundtable. You all have just heard Mr. Lawrence Wong speak about fiscal policy for Singapore. Uh, following that, there had been a moderated conversation with Vikram Khanna from the Straits Times. In this special session, we continue that conversation with a selected panel that will pick up on a number of points in the discussion and give their views on the state of the macroeconomic policy debate. The special session this morning has as its topic fiscal policy and policy measures. We will use this, as I said, to discuss Minister Wong's opening speech against a background of the fiscal situation here in Singapore. I will now introduce my panelists in reverse order from when they will be speaking, from, from how they will be speaking. So over on my extreme left, my friend and colleague, Professor Ramkishan Rajan, Yong Pong Hao Professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Kishan works on international financial policy in Asia and across the world generally, with a focus most recently on, among other things, central banking, ma macro prudential policies on new digital and green finance. And recently, of course, has also written on the wealth tax, something that I'm sure we will be coming back to over the next hour or so. Next to him, coming towards me, is Tamir Baig, Managing Director and Chief Economist, Group Research at DBS Bank. At the bank, Tamir advises on risk management and investment strategy, and also heads up global economics and macro strategy. Just next to me is Chris Wu, who leads on tax at PwC Singapore and PwC Myanmar. But he also heads up PwC work on carbon net zero by 2030 and on the environmental, social, and governance agenda, both for PwC itself and for its clients. The running order of how we proceed from here is that I will invite each of our panelists to give an opening statement, setting out their views on, among other things, the topic of this special session, each of them taking no more than 12 minutes. We will then reach the Q&A session and a panel discussion with about an hour to go, leaving plenty of time for the conversation between my three panelists to unfold and for the, each of them to address questions from our Zoom audience. Let me repeat what Christopher Gee had said earlier. For those in the audience who want to raise questions for the panel or on what Minister Wong said earlier, or what you will be hearing in the next few minutes from the panel themselves, please just type your questions in your Zoom Q&A box. And the IPS organizers will get your questions to me to pose for the panel. So to begin, Chris, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Danny. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I thought I would start off this morning by taking a step back and look at the macro environment and, of course, the international scene. Um, so from the macro environment, obviously, we're still in the midst, unfortunately, of COVID-19. Um, and COVID-19 has taken its toil on 
many aspects, many countries around the world, and of course, the many lives which is impacted. And for what we are seeing, of course, is the fact that governments have been spending a lot to deal with uh, the situation of COVID-19. Uh, and Singapore is, of course, no different. But even before COVID-19, the gov uh, governments around the world had already been facing the question around taxes. Um, the fact that the taxes um, collections were impacted by perceptions of um, planning, uh, that there was broad base erosions and perhaps profit shifting, or what we now know today as BEPS. And behind that, then the international community back in the late uh, 2000s started off uh, discussing it um, and came up with, of course, more recently, um, various solutions in terms of trying to address uh, this issue that they were seeing taxes not being collected where they felt it should be collected, um, taxes which were being uh, taken up in certain countries which were seen to be uh, of lower taxes, and therefore there was an inequality behind uh, the tax collections. And of course, where you have countries where they feel that um, they were providing the substance behind it, they were providing the economic benefits, um, it would be very different from where the taxes were collected or even where the markets were in respect to especially uh, economies which were more digital. Um, we, we use the word digital economy, but frankly, it's, it covers almost every part of the uh, economy because every economy does use, or every um, corporate uses uh, digital nowadays. Uh, but certainly in terms of the platform economies, uh, they were seen to be then uh, a mismatch in terms of where taxes were being collected versus where perhaps the markets were, where the value was being generated. Um, so against this backdrop, of course, these new provisions have been introduced. And to take a, you know, the speed time forward, obviously right now where we are, and most recently, we have an agreement by over 130 countries around a global minimum tax. And a global minimum tax rate of 15% is coming around the corner. Um, obviously subject to a lot of details. As they say, the devil's in the details in terms of what we need to, to do to get this working internationally. Um, and of course, but against the backdrop of that, um, various countries, of course, also have been putting in place their own measures and changes. So um, we face, basically, Singapore faces a, a world where taxes are going to be playing an even greater part of uh, considerations around investments, um, but more so there's going to be a lot of pressure in terms of, I think, what we're wanting to discuss today in terms of our fiscal planning, what should we be doing. And we heard um, earlier from Minister in terms of his sharing around some of the Singapore challenges which we face. And maybe that's a good segue for me to maybe just bring it forward and to end my um, comments. So obviously, what is Singapore going to do? Um, if I look into my little crystal ball and I've got to dust it off a bit, it's a bit cloudy in terms of what exactly is going to be coming out, especially in the budget, which is probably coming come out in February next year. Um, what, what is going to be the changes which will be introduced? So maybe I'll just touch on a few things which Minister spoke about, just to add to it, just to um, add, add my own color to it. Obviously, there's a burning question around tax collections. Um, the situation is that we've been running a deficit for quite a few years, again, coming back to the COVID-19 situation. But obviously, it's not only COVID-19, but Singapore wanting to address various issues which it's facing. And Minister touched on many, I'll, I'll cover a few. Obviously, in terms of the spend which we need from our demographics, aging population, healthcare, the need for education, which has always been a great level playing field, uh, to create a level playing field for um, basic equality. We need to improve the fact that our people, our children, get, get access to good education. Everybody, no one gets left behind. There's the climate. The worry that the climate is going to affect us, and we are certainly very vulnerable as a low-lying country. Um, and there has been many big numbers out there floating around. Yes, there are ways to doing it in terms of raising debt, 
Um, but nevertheless, there are still taxes which may need to be collected. Um, so all this is going to put pressure in terms of what is the budget going to do to turn around. Are we going to be seeing the introduction of GST? In terms of introduction of the increase of the rates of GST from the current percent, 7% to 9%. And Minister touched it briefly, but of course held the cards closely to his chest and did not mention whether it's going to be this year or coming up 2022, or whether he's going to hold it back because he has up to 2025 to introduce it. Um, and then he touched, I think, on a subject which I think has been the uh, subject of many dinner conversations recently, wealth tax. Um, a new form of tax, one may say, uh, although minister did say, well, we currently have wealth taxes. We do have property tax, stamp duties, um, ABSD. Um, but maybe if you start looking at the wealth taxes around the world, and there are not many left, um, there's actually a taxation on assets as well, uh, which is diff slightly different from the property tax. And if you pick on a country which Singapore has always tried to compare itself against, of course, Switzerland. It's the one of few countries in Europe which has held on firmly to wealth taxes. And maybe later on we can talk a bit more about that. So a big question mark, is that going to come about in terms of a wealth tax? Um, so, like I said, it's crystal ball gazing. Uh, I'll finish off here uh, as to whether or not on a domestic front we will see some changes to our tax systems. Obviously, there are many more um, which we can pull out, which the Ministry of Finance, I'm sure, can pull out in terms of uh, its, uh, to overall enhance the Singapore economy. But uh, I'll hand it back to you now. Ben. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for emphasising how these discussions that we're having I mean, it's not just abstract and national level. It also affects all of us as individuals uh, in the tax regime, the evolving tax regime, both here in Singapore and internationally, as you mentioned. Tamir, can I turn to you, please? please. Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. And uh, great to be here with Kishan and Chris and you, Professor Kuo. Um, I think what I'll do is spend my 10 minutes sort of touching on the climate angle with respect to fiscal policy and where Singapore is going and will be sort of forced to go by what's happening globally. Now, we already have pretty decent economic data and analysis on the relationship between carbon taxes and the, its impact on an economy. Uh, European Union particularly has been at the forefront of presenting cross-country studies that show that higher carbon pricing is not detrimental to growth. In fact, it is associated with higher degree of carbon efficient uh, economic outcomes. And it is not just a cross-country, uh, cross-section um, sort of snapshot that is compelling. Uh, just looking at what Europe has done with respect to its emissions trading system and its own carbon taxes, which have gone up in recent years substantially, we've seen actually time series evidence that higher carbon taxes are associated with a decrease in emission. So I think that compelling availability of cross-country and time series evidence uh, makes it um, best practice for a country like Singapore to start considering um, higher than nominal carbon taxes without worrying that that would be detrimental to growth or uh, detrimental to economic efficiency. Um, of course, all countries have their idiosyncrasies. I think the finance minister pointed them out quite cogently in his uh, interjections that Singapore's uh, small size uh, itself is a major constraint with respect to uh, having a very large alternative energy footprint, and that's understandable. At some point, I'd like to talk to Chris about one of the phrases that the finance minister used, which was importing clean energy, and what are the things that are in the pipeline around that. But if we accept that higher carbon taxes are inevitable, uh, what would that higher carbon tax do? Uh, there are several areas of an economy where uh, there is sort of crying need for upgrading the capability of dealing with an altered climate world with global warming, and therefore we need a cleaner industrial sector. We certainly need cleaner power generation practices, both onshore and offshore. Um, the way Singaporean residences and commercial enterprises deal with energy, production, consumption, that can be made greener. Transportation is, of course, a major area where one can finance uh, transition. And again, the carbon tax can finance that. And finally, as the finance minister pointed out, a decade ago, there was no agricultural fisheries sector to really talk about, but there is one. And now we can talk about how 
these um, uh, fisheries uh, of the waters of Singapore can do dual purpose with having solar panels on top of them and also uh, go for fishy culture and things like that. So carbon tax on its own is not a panacea, but targeting certain industries uh, for transformation would be the best way. As the minister was speaking, especially with respect to his three pillar curves, the inequality curve, demographic curve, and the emissions curve, I sort of came to the conclusion there is actually an interlinkage between the first and the third curve. Again, as you create a buffer of revenues through higher carbon taxation, uh, you can use it also for redistributive policies. Uh, and I think some of the notes that we have seen from the IMF in recent uh, years uh, has been sort of focusing on that, that don't look at these things separately. Climate change has disproportionate impact on the poor. Uh, mitigating measures should also be targeted at the poor and their adjustment. Finally, uh, one area that I think that Singapore would have to become uh, cognizant of very soon is this notion of uh, border carbon adjustment taxes, BCAs. Uh, European Union would probably be the first block in the world to move at it, uh, and this would be WTO compliant. So what is BCA? Uh, if you are a country that is imposing carbon taxes and um, are uh, you know, importing uh, various goods from around the world, which may have zero or no carbon taxes on their production, uh, you are allowed to actually levy a tax on them to equalize the, the carbon taxes. Um, and hence, countries that don't have any carbon tax or low carbon tax, if they want to keep up with trade and avoid that tariff potential, they will have to raise their own carbon taxes. Uh, and so again, uh, we may recognize our domestic idiosyncrasies. We may have our own timeline, but the world may move faster than us and we would have to keep up with that. So, so I think those are the considerations that I have in mind when I think of fiscal dimensions on climate change and how also it has redistributive implications. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm sure we'll come back to many of these uh, issues that you've raised. Thank you also for the, the fact, the statistical fact, about what the world looks like in terms of carbon taxation and actual disruptions in growth. We'll come back and discuss that and think about some specific examples that can help us think through the mechanics of that. Uh, Kishan, if I may turn to you next. Thanks, Danny. Uh, I'd actually prepared some comments. I wanted to focus a bit more on fiscal sustainability issues, but having listened to the minister and my uh, uh, colleagues here, I'm, just, I'm going to chuck that aside and just talk about some, I think, some controversial issues that I, I think should be brought up um, in no order, of, no order of importance. Definition of progressivity. Right. Um, yes, Singapore has a progressive tax system, but progressivity defined in terms of marginal income tax rates, earned income tax, as well as amount of tax paid uh, as a share of total tax revenue. Is that, is that sufficient? Uh, do we need to, uh, what about uh, income that is not earned from actual working? Not that I'm suggesting other activities are not work activities, but what about uh, uh, income raised from capital gains, for instance? Should that not be taxed? It's obviously a big issue in the US where they talk about differences in tax rates uh, between income from capital gains versus actual uh, working type income tax. Here, does, here it's even starker because there's no capital gains tax of any sort, right? Should that, uh, is, that an, is that an issue? Uh, does that affect progressivity in any way? Um, then there's a related issue. What if you have capital, uh, capital gains tax uh, uh, is based on realization? What if you don't realize it? What if you uh, buy something, don't sell it, it appreciates and it's inherited? Um, do we then have to worry about the inequality implications of inheritance? Uh, all of, none of us uh, want inheritance tax, certainly we, uh, especially uh, Asians, we think about not just consum consuming for ourselves, but also for the future generations. So we say, well, we are, our income is already taxed, so why should you tax wealth as well? But again, like I said, if part of your income is about uh, is not even taxed because of the asset price appreciation, uh, uh, should that be considered? And also GST. I mean, GST, I'll come back to GST, but the same argument about fairness could hold for GST. You say for a middle class, uh, I understand there are rebates, etc. but for a middle class, you say, well, I'm taxed. Uh, my income is being taxed. Why should I be taxed for consumption as well? So the same philosophical arguments could be made for consumption tax as well. So in any case, uh, that's about that. Um, 
definition of um, wealth tax. So the minister and others have said property. Well, we, we do have some form of wealth tax. Uh, um, uh, we tax property. I'll leave out stamp duty because that's more macro prudential in nature. But really a wealth tax, and we'll, I won't get into details here about feasibility, but a wealth tax is really about net wealth, not gross wealth. Right? And so you could have a middle class who decides to uh, borrow uh, significantly, buy a, a nice condo or, or a landed property, whether they should is there a different issue, but then their net wealth may not be all that high. Right? And so property tax is not a wealth tax per se in a classic definition. Um, since I'm on a roll, what else? Uh, government philosophy. Uh, when we talk about the government philosophy, and I think it's a very reasonable philosophy, which is, um, all recurring expenditures have to be financed by recurring revenues. So we can talk all we want about other sources of revenues, et cetera, the NIRC, the investment income, et cetera. Uh, but yes, those are important, but we, if our recurring expenditures are going to go up, as the minister suggested, as Chris suggested, et cetera, with healthcare, with uh, climate change, adaptation, uh, societal uh, expectations, et cetera, Revenues ought to go up and presumably tax revenues. True. But here I'd say, well, the definition of recurring is it happens every year. If we know that investment income is going to come every year, why don't we just include that as part of recurring uh, uh, revenue as well? Right? And so that's, I mean, uh, it's just a question I have. Um, now, um, uh, GST. I, who knows, right? Uh, but clearly GST presumably... Um, Last, if you look at the budget um, uh, for 2020 during the COVID situation, so you look at the, uh, the government, you have, if you look at the budget statements, you have a primary deficit, you have the basic uh, balance deficit and overall deficit. Historically, and Chris is exactly right, the private uh, primary deficit has been in a moderate, uh, very moderate deficit, but that goes back to the, about 0.3% of GDP because that's consistent with the government's philosophy, philosophy of government expenditures, recurring expenditures much, must match recover, recurring revenue. Uh, what is more interesting to me is the, uh, the basic uh, balance, and correct me if I'm wrong, I forget the exact terminology, but the basic balance includes the primary balance as well as ad hoc transfers. And that's been a bit more source of concern from the perspective of fiscal discipline, not suggesting the transfers have not been needed over the last few years. Uh, but those are ad hoc transfers. And when you add, when you look at that balance, it's about 0.9% of GDP, close to 1% of GDP deficit over the last few years. Uh, and you take a longer period, they're actually from 2008, there have been more instances of that balance being in deficit than it has been in surplus. We have not worried about it until COVID, by and large, because it's been financed through investment income. In fact, the investment income has not only financed that, uh, that balance, but it's also been sufficient to then fund a lot of other uh, endowment and trust fund uh, issues, including the voucher scheme, et cetera, right? which is different from the ad hoc transfer subsidies. Right? So, so the government has very, uh, very smartly created all these endowments for future climate climate adaptation for GST, uh, uh, GST vouchers, uh, uh, rail, et cetera, et cetera, fine. Um, but the re point, I'm, point here is even without COVID, we had this issue about a structural deficit. And so then the question is, if you go back to my earlier point that you, you're not going to in include the investment income in recurring revenue, it was just a suggestion, then you certainly have to think about other sources of revenue. And then the question is, what are the sources of revenue if you decide income tax is not going to work because of demographics as well as supply side incentives? If you decide, uh, yes, you could have corp uh, uh, you could have some other types of asset taxes being raised somewhat. You could have a carbon tax hike. You could, ha you could have user charges, but these are all unless they're raised significantly, they are really at the margin. You really need to think of a, minister used the term, I think, a revenue resilience. You really need to think about an alternative new source of revenue, and GST is not going to cut it. GST, uh, a one-time expected hike of GST, and I think you'll, I don't know, but I suspect it'll happen sooner than, rather than later, because in 2020, uh, our, the deficit here would overall deficit would not nearly, would not have looked nearly as bad if the government hadn't decided to continue with its plan to fund the GST voucher scheme. And I'm not saying that's wrong at all. My point is they've already, they ensured even though COVID happened, they funded it, suggesting that uh, if I were a betting person, I'm not. But if I were, I'd say GST will probably happen sooner than later because the money is already there. And again, the minister also uh, said that himself. Um, I think I've got myself into enough trouble as it is. So I'll stop here and then <laughs> I would say thank you. Okay, Shani, you can never get into 
too much trouble. But uh, thank you for raising these quite deep questions about when we, when we say things, when we use words like progressivity, you know, what's the, the scope that we're actually using, applying this to? And when we try and dig deeper, the kind of progressiveness picture that comes out might not be the one that we start out with. And it's very important to, to ask those questions. Uh, your comments about GST and how effective it is in making moving the needle on the government's fiscal position, I also I think are well taken. And I'd like to get the whole uh, the panel's views on this. Perhaps I can begin. There are questions that have come in that I want to get to, but I wanted to get a discussion going between the three of you first. And let me begin, if I may, by inviting Chris to respond to some of what Kishan has said about these definitions of taxes and the true fiscal position. Chris, could yeah. I get you to begin? Sure. Thanks a lot for the comments. Um, I think what I'd like to just start with is maybe just two analogies which are very important though. I think the first priority must be for, um, in, in any design or, or, or the taxes, is that it should be for Singapore especially, that we grow the pie. Right? We all like pie and we need to continue to grow the pie. I think that is a key thing in terms of what taxes should be used to do. Whether or not it's been used traditionally, of course, as an incentive to bring in um, foreign investors, but obviously that may be under some stress. Um, but nevertheless, it can be used to bring about right behavior. Because while well, taxes do obviously have an outcome of collecting revenue, but it can also drive certain behaviors. And I'll come to that too around, around the carbon taxes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think very importantly, linked to the pie and wanting to make sure that we preserve the pie, not only grow it, but is that we have to remain competitive. And um, much as there is discussions or talk around wealth taxes, we need to be very clear that we need to preserve um, two particular golden geese, goose, um, and, and one of them is, of course, our asset wealth management business. Right? Now, that is a, a large contributor to our economy, not only from jobs, but also from a capital markets perspective um, and our wider industry. And we've, we've been thriving, striving very hard these past decades to make ourselves obviously the heart of Asia, if not maybe even the world now, because of the, the challenges around in other countries. So we need to make sure that whatever we do in terms of um, changes for taxes is that we grow the pie, but we also preserve that golden goose. Um, and I mentioned two industries. So it's our competitiveness and resilience. Right? Um, so maybe I'll, t I'll touch a bit on, on, on the carbon taxes um, pieces because it's also very close to my heart as, I, as you mentioned. Um, I'm looking after PwC's Singapore's net zero efforts and, and what that means is at the moment, well in the days when we used to fly, obviously our carbon credit footprint was significant from all the flights we took. And what did we do? We went out there to buy carbon credits to offset it. Um, fortunately we don't need to do it that much now, um, but of course I think we're all going to return to that eventually. Um, but even then, um, there were many other things which we are doing in terms of making sure we buy renewable energy, um, making sure we look at our suppliers and to see whether, uh, they, are supplying to, whether they are supplying to us in terms of uh, a low carbon footprint type of supplies. Mm. So I think carbon credits has a fantastic way of not just raising revenue. Right? As I said, taxes are there, of course, to raise revenue and, and Singapore had pledged to use this revenue to help the industry which is affected by it, <coughs> excuse me, to cut down on their emissions. Um, but it also drives behavior. And tell me, I think you mentioned in terms of um, what, what we call, I mean, uh, CBAM, right? The Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which is basically pushed forward by the EU in terms of trying to say, okay, fine, we have a lot of carbon taxes in the EU. If you're going to supply into the EU, you need to either um, cut down on your emissions, such that the goods you come in have a low carbon footprint, or you pay the carbon taxes mm. on coming in. So there's been accusations that it's a tariff, etc. but it's not. It's actually to drive behavior, mm. if you see it that way. Mm. Um, and of course, the burning platform is that if we are a manufacturer supplying into to, to Europe, we've got to become um, conscious of that, and we've got to be pre prepared for that once the EU introduces that. Because otherwise, when we import in, we will be less competitive than, say, a supplier within you. Mm. Um, so those are the kind of progressive mm. uh, features of tax which tries to drive certain behaviours. Um, so, so maybe I'll, I'll pause okay. there. I, 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 want to, I want to come back to a number of points that you've raised, Chris. 
They've also come in on the questions about you know, your business, uh, the tax implications, wealth and others, and how your high value clients are responding to this discussion. I want to come back to that because the questions that have come in are actually quite divided. There's a group of questions that come in that say, this shouldn't make any difference. And the other group are saying, no, this is something we really need to be watchful for because it will undermine our competitiveness as a health, as a wealth center. But this issue about carbon tax, I want to bring Tamir into the conversation first. Um, and I want to maybe be a little bit mischievous and provocative just to get some of the discussion. You, you cited the, the studies, statistical studies, that say that raising a carbon tax is not only not disruptive for the economies and societies that they have experienced that, but it's actually perfectly consistent with sustained and, and continued growth. For an economist, this seems too good to be true. It's like a win-win outcome. It's a free lunch. You're not only... Uh, doing the right thing in terms of trying to reduce our carbon consumption uh, and therefore emissions, but at the same time, continuing to spur growth. And many in the audience might be thinking, this is so counter to the experience that I see every day. You raise taxes, it's got to move the needle in the wrong direction. And they might be thinking of the experience of China over the last couple of weeks. As, as we were discussing earlier, China has announced uh, carbon peaking by 2030, net zero by 2060, and they've already begun disrupting the sort of usual power generation industry there. And what we saw happen in the last two weeks is a huge disruption in manufacturing and industrial production. So reconcile this, reconcile this for us, Th help us think through what's going on. Right, I, great question, uh, Prof Kwa. And I think the finance minister's speech and, and when he was responding to Vikram, I think has already given us an answer to that question, which is you can pursue climate change related issues sectorally, it has to be holistic, otherwise you will have the sort of problem that China is having right now, which is if you don't have a deep enough alternative energy grid in place, which can address these sort of episodic shutdowns, um, you will have massive problems. So the very fact that China got serious about coal production this year and told all the manufacturing rich regions to set a very sort of you know, restrictive target as far as their uh, power consumption was concerned was not properly thought through because by June, July, all of these regions, because demand externally was strong, were producing 24 seven and as a result, uh, their power production was, uh, and consumption was going through the roof. So again, you would have to have a, a more resilient grid a more diversified grid, which can address these issues. And I think that would be very important going forward as we embrace more and more alternative energy because we still haven't made technological progress in alternative energy storage. Um, large battery packs are out there, Elon Musk's dream, but still not you know, fully consistent with the way the world can sort of you know, adopt the alternative energy and forego conventional energy. So I think that is China's challenge. That is Europe's challenge. Uh, because of you know, Russia being the monopoly supplier of gas in Europe, there's this big fear of a massive winter coming where there might be uh, major disruptive gas outages. So again, Europe, despite investing heavily on wind and solar, um, may have to sort of rethink their uh, nuclear power strategy. Mm. The, the big legacy of Fukushima was you know, Europe, particularly Germany, said we don't want any nuclear energy. But maybe you know, there is something called safe nuclear, and maybe that has to be embraced as well. So I think that's the key issue, that this is not going to be a free lunch. There is no clean downward slope of increased carbon taxation and reduced carbon intensity. There will be kinks in the curve, and, and countries will struggle. Uh, we're all in it together in some ways. Um, not that the Europeans or the Americans have an answer. We're all trying to figure it out together. So I think on emissions trading, the Chinese have certainly learned from some of the mistakes that the European made in their ETS 1.0. European you know, sort of emission trading system 2.0 seems to be more successful, has more of a guiding hand from the government than allowing the private sector to figure it out. I think the Chinese Euro emissions trading would be something like that. Um, but, uh, but lots of open questions. Okay. We haven't resolved any of these things. Okay. I wanted to touch on one yeah, of the things uh, what Kishan and Chris have to say. Um, Chris, on the wealth management side, I think I would echo what the finance minister said, which is 
Tax rate is one of many attributes that bring businesses to a country. Uh, the classic example would be the mansion tax in London. It hasn't deterred the global wealthy from still buying properties in London. Similarly, in New York, there is now a wealth tax associated with expensive apartments. Market hasn't you know, suffered that much. So I would like to think that Singapore, by offering a wide spectrum of intangibles, can probably remain competitive even if some degree of wealth taxation or higher a foreign buyer's stamp duty were to take place. And that's just my view, because I think Singapore has more to offer than just tax rates. Uh, on, on Kishan's point on whether we should use net income from international reserves as an above the line item to you know, be strictly fiscal, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good point. Uh, typically, at least going by global financial statistics definition, financing items are usually one-off. If you go to the bond market to raise money to finance a deficit, it's below the line. If you privatize a government asset, below the line item. But if you have a state-owned enterprise providing you dividends, that's non-tax income above the line. Similarly, if you have a wealth endowment that is providing income, it should be above the line. Now, there is an exception to that, which is when you look at universities out there, their endowment income is sort of treated below the line. I'm not sure why, but it seems like government of Singapore is also sort of looking at that or, or implicitly behaving the same way, which is that reserves income should not be taken for granted. It may be not that recurrent given market risk and so on, so let's keep it as a financing item. But does it really matter whether we treat it below or above the line? I think what matters is, is Singapore's fiscal profile sustainable? Uh, even if we're going to increase expenditure and transfer substantially in the near and medium term, doesn't this country have massive positive net asset position thanks to the GIC and Temasek and MSS reserves in place? And if that is the case, Singapore should be able to borrow far more than it's borrowed so far, mm -hmm. especially when you compare to the other highly rated borrowers in the West. Singapore's borrowing is nothing, mm -hmm. net or gross. Mm -hmm. um, Kishan, yeah. can I invite you to respond to what Tamir said? Yeah. Yeah, th um, thanks for that. Um, so, uh, uh, Tamir, I agree with you about almost everything you said, you, and universities are universities, uh, different animal. Uh, but the last point, the uh, second last point about uh, does it really matter? I think it matters insofar as the government keeps saying that all recurring expenditures have to be fully fi financed by recurring uh, revenues. And if that's the case and it's below the line item, then the gap will be quite significant once you inco incorporate all these expected uh, increases in healthcare, et cetera. You can leave out probably infrastructure upgrading and climate uh, change adaptation because presumably part of that will be through the single bond. So I do think it matters unless they change their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, you're right, it's terminology, but terminology is, and semantics are important insofar as they keep repeating the same thing about this their philosophy. And again, I don't think either of us are disagreeing about the philosophy generally. It's a good one, but this matters then. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, the wealth, wealth tax issue, so again, Look, I'm, for all, I'm all for competitiveness. I don't want to just because I suggest a wealth tax or some other kind of tax it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the importance of competitiveness. I teach issues relating to competitiveness, etc. So completely, I think we're all on the same uh, page there. Uh, I also understand about the, uh, the concerns about wealth management, but like Timur said, uh, and I'd say actually right now, if you're going to do it, absent, ideally you'd like to have an international agreement with some degree of uh, sovereignty on tax issues, but you'd like to have some degree of uh, agreement on these types of taxation issues so that you don't have tax havens, et cetera, being created. Absent that, I think if you're going to do it, leave out the fiscal sustainability aspect for now. If you decide you're gonna do it, now is probably, or this period is probably uh, as good as any to consider it because the possible alternatives uh, for where high net wealth, uh, wealth individuals might move their, uh, move their finances out is getting uh, smaller and smaller. Some regional economies have their own issues. Uh, yes, you can go to the Middle East, et cetera. I'm not saying you want, and obviously the big, the uh, is issues, obviously how much you're going to increase it by, how, what, kind of, what, what kind of exemptions you're going to give, and the elasticity of the wealth tax that uh, uh, based, uh, that parameter obviously is very important. So I would say in some senses we are, it is a concept that needs to be considered insofar as you don't, a recurring expenditure is going to rise. There is always going to be a trade-off. And so I can't say, I, I don't think we should be saying that this is going to have an impact on this industry. It worsen competitiveness, absolutely right. But other, incre other increases in other taxes are also going to have, uh, there are going to be trade-offs there. 
So if you're going to talk about uh, the cost of a particular tax, let's compare it to cost of uh, in raising taxes in other forms. Unless you say, well, I'm going. To, well, the best thing to do is limit expenditure significantly. But again, Singapore. Uh, uh, it's, uh, expenditures, there's always room for cost efficiency, but expenditures are 16 to 18 percent of GDP, depending on how much you, whether you add the transfers and et cetera, et cetera, and that's, that's already fairly lean. Okay, thank you. A um, number of interesting points that I want to, to continue to push, but I also want to make sure the audience gets their say in at, at this point. Um, so I'm going to turn to an audience question in a, in a minute, but I wanted to first make a comment on, on something that Temir said, and maybe bring it out a, a bit more. The way I read, the way I was listening to what you said, is that we can think about what's happening with carbon taxes, and perhaps some of the other taxes too, in a positive, constructive way. You can think about it as a disruption on business as usual, and then of course then you start worrying about this downward sloping effects. Or you can think about it as opening up opportunities for new businesses, transition type uh, effects. You know, how do we build out the solar panel industry? How do we develop natural gas more efficient? The world develop natural gas more efficiently. And we think about those as growth areas that help us transition to a cleaner, low carbon global economy. There's actually a win-win outcome there that we need to view positively. So I just wanted to, to underscore that that's one of the key messages I took from what, what you said. But now I want to come back to this, this question that all of you have, have touched on, which is the manipulation of wealth tax or carbon tax and its impact on, on competitiveness in Singapore and elsewhere. The variety of views that have been articulated, as I said, by, by the audience and, and uh, coming out one side or the other, and I hear similar kind of divisions here. So I want to ask a very pointed question, beginning with Chris, and then I'll bring in the other two. Chris, what are your multinational corporation and high net worth clients most concerned about when we're discussing these wealth tax and BEPS issues? What are they coming to you with their concerns and how are they responding? Sure. Um, so, so Danny, I'll, I'll use the, just one word which they want to know. It's details. What exactly does it all mean? Because frankly, the word wealth tax is a very broad headline mm. and very scary to many, mm. but you've just got to boil it down to what it really means. Mm. What, is the, what, or what is the likely um, avenue which Singapore could take? Um, but certainly in terms of, just maybe if I can touch on in terms of the tax rate matter relating to the potential that our tax incentives may be at jeopardy. Firstly, let me clarify um, that the global minimum tax uh, uh, is focused on large multinationals. There's a threshold set by the OECD. It's using uh, an earlier number of $750 um, million. Mm -hmm. So any company which is revenue size above 750 million euros, sorry, not dollars, mm -hmm. um, will be affected by the global minimum tax. Mm -hmm. But we have to look at the fact that while Singapore does offer, yes, many benefits in comparison to other territories, um, rule of law, infrastructure, etc., it's still a financial number which is very measurable and which is factored into by almost any investment community when you're deciding, should I invest in Singapore? Should I grow in Singapore because some of them are already here? Or do I put it back home in some states like uh, Missouri or uh, um, you know, Kentucky, they will look at a dollar number. So the difference though between a 5% rate which we could offer versus now a global minimum tax of 15%, mm. that is a big difference, I think. Mm. So I, I just want to just emphasize that because it is still a very measurable number and I see, coming back to your question, Danny, our clients are saying, hang on guys, what's going to happen? Yeah. The debt's disappearing. Yeah. Right? And they have been asking. So is there a potential to incentivize them in a non-tax way, which would then take it out of the global minimum tax net? Mm. For example, helping them around our high cost of labor, mm. which you could flip it to help grow jobs still, or to grow even high skilled jobs, focus on R&D jobs, for example, high tech jobs, and focus on reducing another high cost in Singapore, unfortunately, our land. So, so there are these options there. Mm. So let me come back to the wealth tax side. As I said, wealth tax is very broad, and, and we need to just be careful about it. Yes, there are systems, for example, as I mentioned earlier, Switzerland, which taxes 
everything you own. But, and it's on a net basis, right? It's after debt. But, and, and minister did, t did touch on it, but yeah, you don't want something where there's mobility because people can just take the, the bags of cash and maybe go somewhere else, right? Sure, definitely that debt is true in, in today's world. Um, so you don't want that. And you want it to be administratively easy. You don't want to spend time chasing after that bag of cash which has gone somewhere else. So maybe the wealth tax should be focused on specific types of assets which are less mobile. Mm. So the least mobile asset which I checked last time is real estate. Mm. And it's real estate, just to give you a scale of real estate with value, there's 69,000 landed properties in Singapore. Just take out a calculator and put a number to it. But again, it's not trying to affect the real estate market. That, that's not the point behind it. But maybe it's in terms of assets which have been sitting there. And Minister touched on it very briefly. I, I didn't quite catch the phrase he used. Mm. But in terms of wealth which has just accumulated in Singapore over the years, just by doing nothing. Mm. Mm. You've just sat there, you bought at the right time, right, right location, location, location. Mm. And the value has gone up. Mm. Mm. Right? Mm. And maybe it's a focus on like I said, wealth has just been created by the fact that Singapore has grown. Mm. So that could be it. So it comes back down to addressing the question, we don't want to scare the family offices, the wealthy individuals who believe Singapore is a nice place to live, the right place to live because of so much that we offer. Right? So we need to understand that we should carve out certain pieces. Mm. We don't want to scare new wealth either, wealth which has been created because to go down a capital gains tax regime would be a slippery slope, mm. very slippery slope. And, and we shouldn't go back because once you've set the goalposts, don't move it. Mm. Mm. So we need to be mindful of all of this and design it very carefully. Okay. I'm not saying I have the solution. Obviously, it's up to the minister. Okay, but, but thank you for that. Uh, because it, I mean, that, among other things, addresses a question that um, Victor Mills in the audience had asked. Victor is somebody that you will all know, and he had asked, what type of wealth taxes will achieve the goals of preventing capital flight and increasing revenue in meaningful amounts? And one of the things you said, Chris, really uh, strikes the, the nail on the head here, which is that when we think about wealth tax, just as we think about taxing other things, we need to fine tune the wealth tax in such a way that it's the, the highest rates are inversely related to the elasticity of movement of the factor. Those things that are nailed to the ground here in Singapore are things where there's actually no loss of economic efficiency from imposing a higher tax. It benefits everybody, benefits all of society. There is no, no, no dead weight loss from that reduction. And in addition, that lowers the risk of the flight of these resources elsewhere. Uh, the, you know, the, that raises the question that I think both Tamir and Kishin had also uh, mentioned, which is that we need to be more holistic in how we view, uh, say, progressiveness, or even holistic in how we view competitiveness of the economy. We can't look at just a single tax, can't look at just a single asset. And so, like Tim, you made the point that Minister also did, which is that when we are thinking about how much wealth tax makes us not competitive, it's not just that. It's the intellectual property environment, it's the productivity, it's the human capital, all of that matters too. But then the question that the audience picked up in, in thinking about this is, yes, all that is true, but there are other city-states, both in this region and elsewhere, who are close to Singapore already, all these other things. And for them, the marginal consideration that does matter is the tax rate, is the wealth tax or other kinds of tax. So, so very pointedly, Vivek wants a comparison with Hong Kong that I'd ask you all, I, I want to ask you all to speak to, which is Hong Kong, another city-state, its experience VAT or GST is light. It is VAT naive, to use the words of the multi-ministry <laughs> task force. Uh, it has also very low income tax rates. How will Singapore's tax framework compare with Hong Kong? Let me leave that out there for the three of you to address however you wish. 
Tell me you can begin, and then I'll, I'll invite the other two to come in on that. Hong Kong, our great competition. Right. So given the geopolitical reality of the time, I don't think Hong Kong is a you know, jurisdiction that Singapore has to worry about. I think Dubai would be a more apt Dubai. Okay, let's do Dubai. Where it's yep. very tax light mm. and increasingly uh, long-term immigration friendly. Mm. So yeah, I mean, let's, I mean, we should not be naive about it. There are other countries, other jurisdictions who will offer compelling structures to global wealth to be parked there. Uh, and therefore, um, you cannot, uh, you know, be sort of you know impervious of that reality. But at the same time, the developments we're talking about are global multilateral agreements. So you would think that respectable jurisdiction will all have to abide by that minimum standard. You can, though, for example, the thing that we're talking about with Chris about the companies with 750 million revenue being subject to 15% minimum tax, Dubai will not be able to run away from that reality either. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's a global carbon tax, as long as the global minimum corporate income tax that are being agreed upon by hundreds of countries, I really don't think Singapore has to worry about competitiveness. Mm -hmm. It's a structural development. It is not idiosyncratic to Singapore. Mm -hmm. Now, on issues related to wealth tax, which may or may not be something that is keeping the Ministry of Finance officials awake in Dubai or Hong Kong, but certainly uh, give, being given serious consideration by Singapore's officials, I think the issue of, you know, tangible nature of the assets come in. Years ago, when I was at LSE, one of your former colleagues, Professor Schenkerman, gave lectures on asset specificity and post-contractual opportunism, which is a very big set of words for law and economics convergence about more intangible the assets are, the more you can take advantage of the owners of those assets because they cannot just take it and move. So steel factory would be one. Mm -hmm. Property would be another. Refineries in Singapore would be the other. You know, Shell just cannot leave Singapore like that. So, so I think that is something that companies understand. That is something that governments can understand. And I think there is a point of convergence there where marginal increase in tax rates will not necessarily change the reality there. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, the GCB point is very well taken. Chris. OK. <laughs> GCB. Kishan, did Thanks, you want to come in? Yeah, just a point you made, and it's something we teach our students, right? A tax rate imposed on a good with high elasticity should be lowered than uh, one uh, with low elasticity. But think about the social implications of that. I mean, if you, if you really if, forget about asset transfer, mm -hmm. What, I mean, if you take that to its logical conclusion, that uh, who, is, who tends to be the least mobile? Mm. The lower income, some of the uh, lower middle income, et cetera. So based on that logic, so I don't disagree with logic, but if you take it to its extreme, then taxes should be much more re regressive, right? And so I, so I appreciate that as a general uh, point of view, uh, but I don't think can, uh, that should guide everything in terms of how we uh, undertake tax policy, number one. Number two, a lot of this was also debated early on when we talked about in the earlier literature about uh, uh, tax incentives on pollution havens, et cetera. And most of the uh, literature suggests that, as Timor uh, mentioned, that other factors also matter. Keeping uh, everything else equal, you change this marginal tax rate, yes, there'll be a, there'll be a behavioral response. But to a large extent, what Singapore has been doing uh, has been not just increasing, or if they do increase tax rates, it's done with a particular purpose of making the country stickier. Mm. Right? And so once you take that into account, I'm not sure the behavioral, yes, there will always be a group of people. And if you ask me, you know, people always ask high net worth individuals, et cetera. Uh, uh, you ask a middle class person or a lower income uh, person, well, do you want this tax or should this tax be lowered or higher, uh, lowered or raised? Uh, they also have very strong points of view. That doesn't mean necessarily they're actually going to follow suit uh, on what they say once the tax uh, change is undertaken. That being said, again, no one is suggesting it all. Uh, Chris is exactly right. In some senses, we are. Uh, discussing this at a philosophical level. It's really about what kind of uh, tax, the rate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't disagree about the property dimension. My only concern here is uh, with, depending on what kind of property it's imposed, it leads to significant amount of distortions within the real estate market, number two. Number one, number two, it doesn't take care of the basic issue. Again, there are behavioral responses. I decide, okay, I'm going to come here. I'm going to park my money here for wealth management. I'll, I want to enjoy all the benefits that Singapore has. But wait a minute, I'm not going to buy. I'm just going to keep renting. Yeah. Right? And so then what you end up doing is most of us citizens, residents, et cetera, who see this as a home, see this as a 
proper bona fide home, regardless of the tax uh, rate, and might end up being the ones who are penalized with, with, the, with increase in yep. property tax. Of course, you could say, well, it's only a small group who have bought landed property, but still. Yeah. Excellent, excellent point. The, you know, I, I, Chris, I'm going to ask you to, to expand further on something that Tamir said about our international competition, Hong Kong, Dubai, wherever else. On uh, uh, Kishan's point about the, you know, sort of the, the general rule in, in public finance theory that says that we want to tax more those assets that aren't so movable, that don't, don't run away, less elasticity. It also reflects a, a general tension in this discussion about the fiscal situation in Singapore between progressivity and efficiency. The point about taxing inelastic assets is an efficiency point. But as you uh, indicated, rightly, Kishan, that if we take that to its logical extreme, that might be that we then end up penalizing poor people who are not so mobile. And so you know, we've ended up putting something very regressive in place when we're trying to do something efficient. I think that's, that's a lot of food for thought there that I want to come back to that is reflected in some of the other questions. But before we lose sight of something that Tamir said, Chris, our international competition and the responsiveness of capital wealth in this economy, a hugely important part of, of Singapore's uh, financial services industry. Who do we have in mind as the competition? Hong Kong, Dubai, other international financial centers in this, at this state of play, when we're thinking about wealth tax, who is it internationally that we need to be calibrating on? I, I think Hong Kong is definitely still in terms of, um, if you see the concentration of relevant professionals, the infrastructure, especially the capital markets, it's still seen as, I suppose, somehow competition doesn't seem quite the right word. To me, it's complementary. Um, simply because they have in a way a focus on a different market. Many of our clients who are here in Asia would want to see both having Singapore and Hong Kong to an extent. Mm. Hong Kong being a focus mainly on the hinterland and to some extent North Asia. Singapore definitely being in the heart of Southeast Asia. Mm. 50 million people, large growing GDP, mm. potential is fabulous. So I, I think I just see it as complementary. Sure, there is still some healthy competition for talent, some healthy competition for some projects, but generally seen as complementary. Okay. And certainly to Tari's point earlier about recent events, which maybe have settled down, um, but the way it's been settled down obviously has also created its own concerns where I suppose we're seeing certain investors come through and say, hang on, maybe we shouldn't put all those eggs in the northern mm. side, we should bring it down towards the south and Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, so we're still, cons we're still seeing investors coming in here. Okay. Um, okay. But not necessarily fleeing Hong Kong. All right. That's what I would put it as. Like I, said, I see it as um, hedging in a way and complementary. Very good. I'm going to come back to this competition idea because there's competition not just in wealth management but in carbon taxes and, and protectionist type, type issues. But first, before we, we, we leave this sort of general area, uh, and this question for all three of you, I want to get your sensing, your reading of Singapore's preparedness for a next stage in the, the green economy. So building on, on an earlier part of the conversation where we said um, we should look at carbon taxation and its proper manipulation as creating opportunities for, for new businesses rather than as disrupt, you know, rather than just killing out old ones. So the experience with China that we've seen the past couple of weeks showed that while Xi Jinping announced these wonderful two carbon policies, the state of industry itself had not geared up to be prepared for that. So my question for the three of you is, what is the state of Singapore's preparedness if we're going to move even further ahead onto this carbon tax idea? Fossil fuel concentration that a number of us have mentioned that, uh, that Vikram raised with our minister. Uh, Singapore has, for the last few years, moved quite a bit into a fossil fuels industry. And obviously, there's some unwinding that will need to be done if we're going to transition to the newer, greener economy. So given your experience, the three of you, what is the state of Singapore's preparedness in making this transition? Maybe I'll begin with uh, with and then I'll ask Kishin and then Chris to jump in. Sure. Um, 
I have a few thoughts on that matter, uh, Prof. Koch. I just want to finish with uh, one point that Kishan made, which was important. I want to expand on that. It's this issue, again, of you know, competitiveness and uh, uh, you know, tax rate. I mean, Chris has also talked about it. Look at the latest example of Facebook. They have given an earnings warning that now that Ireland would be you know, subject to that 15% tax rate, that their earnings might be affected. Mm. Facebook is not running away from Ireland. They're resigned to the lower earnings, and they're warning the investors. And why is that the case? Because in this ESG world, if Facebook were to leave Ireland on the G score, they would look really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And this is the reality that companies will face more starkly going forward. If you are engaging in as active as tax management or tax efficiency planning that you used to in the past, you're going to get negative points on the G part of ESG. Mm -hmm. And investors will penalize you for that. The market and the readers will penalize you for that. Um, so again, um, as, as Kishan said, that you know, this might be the best time of all to go ahead and take some of these measures. I fully agree. I think the zeitgeist has shifted very sharply. And it's not that easy for companies to play country against country at a time when we're seeing common ground around the world on a multilateral basis mm -hmm. taking place. Now, to your point, question about Singapore's preparedness. Uh, last month, I had a conversation with uh, Ma Jun, uh, who used to be a PBOC chief economist, now represents China in the G20 on climate change issues. During the conversation, which is recorded and you can hear my reaction, he mentioned some very large numbers. And I visibly gasped because I was convinced that he was getting yuan versus dollar mixed up, but he wasn't. He was saying that China should be spending, and again, trust me, I'm not getting my trillions and billions mixed up here, 75 trillion US dollars in the next 40 years, which amounts to 10% of GDP every year from now till 2060, if it were to achieve its net zero target. These are mind-boggling numbers. This is basically taking on basically a Manhattan project every year for the next 40 years. And, and they are now going on in the public domain and sharing of the world that in order for their economy to transform, that's an am amount of green financing they have to raise. It could be partially from the government, largely from the private sector, but whatever the mix, 10% of GDP every year. Compared to that, Singapore is still at the baby phase. A lot more needs to be done. I think it was. Pretty impressive when last year, or was it two years ago, we heard about the $100 billion program over the next remainder of the century to deal with rising sea levels. At that time, that number seemed very large to me. Mm. Now when I hear the sort of numbers that Chinese are talking about, and I look at the challenges of, you know, myriad of challenges that are out there for energy transition, it does not look very large anymore. Uh, so much more to be done and much more money to be raised on the climate finance side. But our export on climate finance is right here, so yeah. maybe he'll add, add on issues. I was actually going to say I have no expertise on this, so I'll leave it to Chris, but since Daima brought this up. Uh, so just at a broad level, you asked about prepared, uh, how prepared uh, is Singapore. Well, I think about, in some senses, they are more prepared than most because of this whole of government approach to uh, climate uh, uh, improving cl climate resilience. Uh, Yes, I work uh, to some extent on the central banking side, but one of the big debates in sen among about central banks in getting involved in climate change and green financing, et cetera, is uh, they can't be the only game in town. And this has been a concern for a number of other countries. And it's clearly not the case in Singapore. So when you think about the green plan and think about what MS is doing on the green finance side, it's sort of complementary to the overall uh, green plan. Uh, also, solvent wealth funds, I think that's uh, uh, it's important, I think, um, uh, uh, reading the statement by, I think, Tom, the Tomasic head, a form, former head, who said, well, when it comes to, yes, we are focusing on uh, greening our portfolio, et cetera, but we don't think, and I'm paraphrasing, we don't think it's useful to just say, well, we're going to get rid of, divest away from all fossil fuel related companies or companies that are not green as of now. We'll Instead, we'll work with them to, uh, uh, to help green their activities. And so I think that and I think that's important. So your sovereign wealth funds doing what they're doing, uh, MS is doing what they're doing. We have the government green plan. Also on the petrochemicals, environmentalists here would say, well, Singapore is going too slow. But then, like you mentioned about the China situation, I think you have to balance these things. It's every all these policies are about trade-offs, right? You know, if you go too fast, then you'll have other types of implications, whether it's about supply-side driven in, uh, inflation, whether it's about unemployment, et cetera. Of course, if you go too slowly, the stock keeps building up of environmental pollution. So I think they're trying, uh, they're, they're trying to manage it. So all, overall, I think they're probably more uh, 
be better position to deal with this than most uh, other uh, countries. The one caveat I'd put is about carbon tax, and I may be wrong, so don't, don't quote me on this, but when you look at the budget statements, right, uh, I didn't see, so f f in the case of GST, clearly you see the GST voucher scheme, uh, uh, which is meant to uh, offset uh, the increase for the lower income. I didn't see that, I, I don't see, I didn't see such a thing for carbon tax increases. So, uh, so in terms of prepare, uh, being prepared for that, uh, probably not yet from the perspective, in terms of the rebates that were given, I don't know where that will come from or whether they're going to talk about, uh, talk about implementing carbon tax, but that's going to be into the f future. I forget exactly what the minister said about it. And that would then mean creating another trust fund to deal with cost deferments or, or for some industries on the, when carbon tax, uh, taxes are hiked later on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, I'm going to sharpen that general question we've been discussing in your case and connect it with something that Faisal in the audience has asked. But I'm going to do that in, in just a minute, if I may. I wanted to remark on something that Taimur and Kishin have both said, and that I, I, I think we need to remark on. When we started talking about this carbon emissions curve, green economy transition, we've gone also from talking about fiscal policy, taxation, to monetary policy, macroprudential policy in general. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, as, as, as you both are, are well aware, uh, central banks in the world, uh, MES is leading on some of these, but central banks in the world some time back were focused on one problem, mm -hmm. price stability, inflation target. That's all they did. And they arrived at that after a long, tortuous process. This is what we want to do. Finally, we're going to get to it. And then a few years after that, that industry was disrupted because all of a sudden, macro prudential policy means that they need to look at everything, including climate change, including policies that help encourage green finance. And so this is a coming together of both fiscal and monetary policy on this large existential problem for the world. And, and it's reflected most clearly, I think, in, in the example that you cited, Tamil, of, of the experience of the PBOC to add to that conversation, uh, Governor Cho, previous Governor Zhou Xiaochuan, when he was coming to the end of his term, he said, you know, all of you central banks out there who are just doing inflation targeting, we wish we had that flexibility. We're still a developing economy. We need to worry about all these other things. But now, of course, PBOC is leading the charge on green finance. It is using its, its vast monetary power in a macro prudential way initiated originally by Mark Carney and other people now to look at these issues. So this is something that's hugely important. Now I want to go from this very large fiscal policy, monetary policy, central bank issue to talking some very micro issues on preparedness. Okay, and in particular, as we talk about transition out of certain industries, building out certain other industries, there are stakeholders in each of these industries. And the question is, how prepared are those? How, how sensitive are the stakeholders that you see, that you meet in your work, to the cost to be preparing for transition from fossil energy, fossil fuels to greener energy? As we talk about fiscal policy and monetary policy at these very large ends, what are people on the ground, investors, thinking about as we make this transition? I wonder if you might have some insights you wanted to share with us on this, Chris. I mean, look at clients, sure. what are they concerned about? So obviously, there are many stakeholders, but maybe I'll just boil it down to, to just two areas first. Firstly, there's still the mandatory market. Those industries which have to pay carbon taxes at the moment, mm -hmm. so Singapore has a relatively small group, so the petrochemical industry, um, where they need to pay carbon taxes, which are relatively low in Singapore, at $5 a metric ton. Then there's the far larger group, which is more the voluntary market. The voluntary market, the likes of ourselves, the likes of many banks, where you don't have to do anything. Right? What you have to do is though react to then your stakeholders. Your stakeholders are, of course, for many companies, your shareholders, but the wider public. Your stakeholders are also in terms of, I suppose, uh, the, the, the broader society in terms of how they view um, certain companies. So that has been driving a lot of the changes. That's been driving a lot of the changes to want to embrace, call it net zero, can call it low carbon emission path, but they're doing it in a very serious way mm. because they're being pressured by many things. One of them 
of course, is just music to, to a PwC or any accounting firm, is reporting. The fact that it needs to be reported, and of course, there's an SGX consultation paper out there right now, mm -hmm. in terms of what should be reported. How should companies be held accountable and to what standard? And there are many, many size-based targets, etc. Um, so that is itself already creating a mega ecosystem there. In terms of companies then wanting to achieve it, as I mentioned earlier, the fastest way to bring down your emissions level mm. is to spend money to buy the carbon credits, yeah. which itself is a great industry from many perspectives. Because if you look at the nature-based solutions at the moment, yeah. what does it do? It's actually funding um, large communities, yeah. communities in the forests, coastlines to preserve yeah. basically their neighborhood yeah. and actually preserves their livelihoods and health because you don't burn stuff, you yeah. don't reduce it. They're actually paid there to produce some sort of eco-prosperity. Yeah. And, and it's fantastic from that perspective. But coming back here to Singapore, what we're seeing, well, probably the largest, uh, most obvious one is this formation of CIX, mm. the Climate Impact Exchange, which is going to be a fantastic mm. testimony for Singapore, again, as a capital uh, center, where we're going to be trading, facilitating the trading of, of, of uh, mm. carbon credits. Mm. And I think that, that's a, a great way to start. Yeah. And behind that is a lot of various other funds as well, which are developing it. Yeah. And don't forget, we don't just want to focus on nature-based carbon credits. We want to focus on maybe renewable energy carbon credits, and or even to some extent, the recyclable sites. Yeah. Because there are a lot more recyclable industries in terms of from plastics to food waste, etc. Yeah. I think all that's going to be building an industry by itself. And of course, we're seeing many of our clients actually taking ESG, or the climate side of it, to become actually their new services. Yeah. From our banks, the green financing side, PwCs, and of course, the ST engineering and all the manufacturers yeah. are changing it. So, um, and of course, there's the food what side as well, which Tamir, you mentioned as well, which is going to be another element yeah. relating to it, the sustainability. I think we've got a fantastic um, opportunity for us to grow, to, to build on our coming back to our energy of the pie. Yeah. And I think this budget, which is going to come out, there's going to be a lot more focus about incentivizing all of us to do the right thing. It's, it's, uh, it's growing there. Yeah. So, so, yeah, no, a, a full blown carbon market, not just within economies, but internationally would be a transformative way of talking about some of these issues. And that would uh, so remove it from the discretion, because it's going to be a market. There's a market out there. We allocate credits. We'll let these credits get traded. It removes it from discretion of an ever-changing political complexion within many nations. Um, I want to now pick up on, on something else. On, you know, it looks like all the questions are about carbon taxes. And I don't want to forget that we also talked about inequality uh, and, 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 and demography and aging. Um, but I just wanted to make a quick point, Kishan, because you had asked the question, uh, you know, because with GST, we have permanent GST vouchers and, and other kinds of schemes to help the lower income. With the carbon taxation scheme, there's also the USAFE vouchers. Minister did mention them. Um, I, I don't remember yet reading many more details about that, unlike with the others. So that's something to watch for. But I think the government is mindful of the progressive or otherwise nature of this too. So, um, okay, now I want to ask a question now about demography and then I'll come back to inequality. And then as the time is running up, I want to get some general views from all three of you about how uh, you see progress on these challenges that, that Minister of Finance has laid out, wh where we can see we've successfully met the challenges. Uh, so on the aging society, uh, you know, we've lost a significant, Singapore has lost a significant resident population during the pandemic. I think Vikram mentioned the, the actual percentage reduction in numbers. Uh, this question comes from Faisal in the audience. Given this loss in, in resident population, how do you see the impact on economic, on revenue growth and economic policies going forward? Now, Minister did mention that one of the critical things is we've got to remain open as a nation, as an economy, to, to flows of talent and, and ideas and expertise. But 
the fact on the ground is we have lost a significant residential population. What is your estimate for how this impacts the revenue growth and economic policies going forwards? Uh, maybe I can begin with Kishin, and then I'll come back, unfold in this direction. Sure. Um, so I think uh, the number was about 4% uh, decline in population. Yep. Uh, yes, it was across the board, but primary, so PRs with government is generally kept at about 0.5 million came down slightly, but uh, the bulk was really about foreigners, like you mentioned. Uh, so how I'd see it, I can't say about revenue growth. I don't know in terms of uh, how you do calculations there to figure out, so I can't say anything uh, on that. But in terms of economic growth, I'd look at how it would affect economic growth, assuming it's not a trend. And presumably it's not given that it's a one-off, but who knows? I mean, if you look at the share of, uh, of foreigners in overall uh, labor force, what is it up to now? It's about uh, 35, 38% or so, give, uh, give or take, right? Uh, so if you then say, okay, four, there's a 4% decline in uh, labor force, then I'd say, well, uh, what is the, take out COVID, we have on average about 4% 4, 4 growth over a decade before COVID. Out of that, Vikram mentioned 1% one one plus productivity. I think the number is about 2.6 because there's in the last decade, uh, because there's a divergence between domestic uh, oriented firm, firm industry versus the outward oriented. There's a big difference in the productivity, but I think labor productivity is more in the two plus range. Uh, so you take that, and so then the difference is labor force growth, right? About two percent plus again the numbers broadly right so so what the way i would do this is say well your four percent decline of a resource that's contributing about two percentage to overall or fifty percent of growth uh then do the math there so that's how i would look at so is there going to be an implication certainly there'll be an implication for uh a short-term economic growth uh, unless there's a pickup in productivity and we know productivity is pro-cyclical so there will be a pickup uh so that's how i think about growth sorry i can't give you exact numbers on this certainly not the revenue side because you just don't i just don't know of those four percent what tax rates they were paying etc i think there's a more fundamental issue though about for all our talk about is there an ideal ratio of foreigners in the overall labor force, overall population, et cetera, we sometimes, we have acted so far as though it's all for us to choose. Mm. Well, as the shock has shown, sometimes things could happen that uh, could change all those calculations. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, you've given us a, a way to start thinking, start doing the calculations on this, and we haven't actually quite, quite done those calculations, but it's very suggestive what you've said. Timer. Uh, Professor Ko, large scale empirical studies of demographics show that there is fairly powerful relationship between aging and weakening of productivity, weakening of fiscal performance and weakening of growth. But it should be seen in context of where in the cycle an economy is. Mm -hmm. For Scandinavian countries or Japan, and I would add Singapore to that argument, getting rich once you become old it's okay. I mean, getting old once you become rich is okay, uh, because <laughs> there is, you know, that wealth to then look after you and pay for your health care and so on, right? It is, you know, getting old while poor is the, is the big problem. And this is where the challenge for some developing countries come in, that they should take advantage of their young demographics to push up their income so that, you know, by the time their demographic dividend starts abating, they have become rich. So I think Singapore has done a fantastic job of taking advantage of its demographic dividend of the 60s and 70s and 80s and go up the income ladder substantially. And now with very high per capita income and very strong net asset position, uh, it's not a silver tsunami. It's, you know, the, this society will turn silver. It seems inevitable given the choices on immigration the country is making, but it is manageable from that risk perspective. Hmm. Uh, and I think Japan's example over the last 20 years is classic. When we were the IMF, we were constantly criticizing Japan for not being able to boost productivity and boost potential GDP growth rate. Yes, Japan has a lot of debt on a gross basis, but it is not heavily indebted on a net basis. It doesn't have any external vulnerabilities from a financial perspective, and its per capita income levels are very, very high, and the Japanese people in general enjoy a very high standard of living. So there is no reason why Singapore cannot emulate that, given the per capita income level it has already attained. Mm -hmm. And the risk of 
turning uh, of the demographic dividend and as a result um, being resigned to a future of anemic growth, anemic productivity, and uh, virtually no improvement of standard of living, I don't think is quite the case in the context of Singapore. Um, now, of course, the advantage that a young, vigorous nation brings to a society is far greater than just the productivity angle and the growth angle. It adds, adds a certain degree of vigor to a nation. Uh, you're not going to have a nation that is pretty old on average winning golds in the Olympics because there aren't too many young, talented athletes to do that. You wouldn't have a sense of you know, rejuvenation in the cultural cycle the way we see in South Korea. Mm. Not a particularly young nation, mm. but sufficient number of young, talented individuals to create massive so soft power that the country is exporting around the world, right? Japan, similarly, doesn't have a lot of young people, but a very vigorous young population, which is also on the margin of creating soft power for Japan. So I think we need to sort of rethink some of the uh, macroeconomic stylus facts that we've all sort of grown up with as far as you know, being young as a society is great and being old as a society is terrible. Mm -hmm. It's actually what you do with the whatever young population you have and what you do with the world that you've accumulated I think is far more important. Yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting point. What's the multiplier effect that we're getting now from different demographic age groups as, as technology as the environment changes, right? I mean, the the emergence of South Korean soft power in, in K-pop, in, in drama, uh, in Squid Game, a range of other things will have actually important economic impact in, and, and geopolitical implications that we are only beginning to, to explore now and that Singapore might perhaps want to think about how we recalibrate the, the analysis on this. Chris, can I ask you to, to come in on this as well? Uh, if, if you want to, uh, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to give the economist sort of perspective, but certainly in terms of the tax collection perspective, yeah. I mean, as the population ages, I think we've just got to think about it more from the, the workforce. Mm. Firstly, um, we'll ask, are the number of salary earners dropping? Mm. Because don't forget, personal taxes account for probably the second highest or, or the third highest in terms of hold of uh, tax collections for, for Singapore. Mm. Um, as people retire, they'll just stop earning salaries and they'll be maybe deriving mainly investment income. Most of it's not subject to tax. Mm. Dividends, interest, mm. and of course our famous capital gains. Mm. All not subject to tax. Mm. So, but doesn't mean that their job disappears because someone younger comes up, takes over that salary, and the whole cycle comes in. Comes in. So I, I don't think it's going to hit the... Uh, tax collections from the personal tax perspective, unless the number of jobs drops, mm -hmm. which hopefully is not the case again, mm -hmm. go to pie. Mm -hmm. GST, though, is an interesting part. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, whether or not you're working or not working, you still got to spend. Sure, you're not working, maybe you spend less, but many of us, like you said, like to retire with a bit more in our pocket and we want to enjoy ourselves, more time to eat, more time to play golf, etc. You'll be spending money. Yeah. And with GST, you'll be paying GST, maybe not at 7% anymore, but at 9%. And yes, we will help the certain groups which do need the help, okay. but many also won't be, and hopefully they'll be spending more, and hopefully that will help to increase the tax collection in terms of from the silver tsunami. Um, because unfortunately, many of us will also need to spend more on health. Uh, so, so it will come in there in terms of generating that yeah. revenue streams in terms of from at least the second and third highest, which is yeah. GST yeah. and personal income taxes. Um, I, I think that that's the way it's, it's yeah. going to be, and hopefully um, not many people just leave the country. <laughs> but, you know, but again, Chris, the, we could think about it as having to spend on health, or we could think about it as here's a growth opportunity. What are the health industries and businesses and firms and entrepreneurs that we need to put in place to provide service to that very important segment of the population. I think there's lots of upside here. Now, I, I want to be sure that we don't run out of time before I give all of you an opportunity to put up a scorecard. Okay, now, I, I'm not going to play the game where we scorecard what's already happened. I want to play a game where we scorecard what's going to happen coming in the future. In other words, I want you to speculate on a possible set of ways markers, uh, key points, milestones that we can use to think about the challenge that Finance Minister 
laid out for us. Okay. And I want you to do that first by reading out a question, an important question that's come in, and then I want to make that concrete in terms of the scorecard. So here's, here's the question. Okay, and the question is a wonderful question. I think it's quite general, and it's, I want to make it concrete. So here's the general question. How important is it for the broader voting public in Singapore to understand these changes in the fiscal system that we are discussing here, that Minister discussed earlier? How do we communicate these as changes in a value system that needs to underpin Singapore's ongoing fiscal journey? Now, now that's very important, but it's also quite abstract. But it points to, a, to something that we need to communicate well to the Singapore public. And I want to get us started on that communication by inviting you to put up a scorecard, a forward-looking scorecard. Okay. So the, the minister spoke to us about three curves, three challenges, inequality, demography, emissions. We have spent a lot of time unpacking some of the details on that. But we also recognize that all three of these challenges, inequality, demography, emission, these are long-term challenges. They are slow burning and they're aspirational. And there's a sense in which we will never quite get to the end of them. Okay. We will know when we have failed, but what I want to invite you to speculate on is to help the public think about how we know when we have succeeded. What are the markers or milestones going forward the next five, 10 years that we want to be able to tick off that says Minister Wong, when he talked about this, yeah, we've made this progress. Here's the progress we've made. What are the markers that the three of you would want to put forwards as a way to think about, calibrate, judge the progress that we're making on meeting these challenges? Now, you're all busy scribbling as if I've set an exam question. <laughs> I haven't set an yeah. exam question <laughs> because I, I want you to just speculate, speculate about the things that matter to you from where you're sitting. And if I, I, if I may, I'd like to begin coming in the opposite direction from how we began, if that's okay. Not quite, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Kishin. I, I actually did say, since you brought up exam, I was going to say before I started that this sounds like a qualifying exam for qualifying for uh, qualifying exam for PhD student in public policy. Um, uh, in any case, um, uh, the markers, I'm not sure I can, uh, uh, what I'm going to say makes any coherent sense, but First of all, starting with the minister's statement, so I thought it was logically constructed. I think when we talk about communication, that's exactly what needs to be done, not talk about, oh, let's just talk about the wealth tax, why we need it. Let's just talk about GST in isolation. Think about the broader framework. I think uh, uh, he, the speech in that sense was very coherent. Uh, and they were, So in terms of, let's talk about inequality first. I think... Uh, I don't think there's ever going to be an end marker for inequality. Right? Inequality uh, is always a relative issue. Uh, as societies, initially we could always say, well, as long as we deal with poverty, and yes, we can raise the minimum uh, income standard line, et cetera, but as, as with Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, Paul Samuelson, uh, uh, the great Paul Samuelson is supposed to have quoted as, as saying, he was asked about, is he happy uh, in what exact context, I don't know. He said, well, uh, as far as I'm concerned with the textbook sales, et cetera, I'm doing far better than most of my other colleagues. So yes, I'm quite happy with, my, uh, with where I stand, right? And so I don't think we're ever going to sort that situation out. That being said, um, there are two things. I think uh, we do really need better data on wealth inequality. Uh, it's, it's an issue. Uh, I think, uh, yes, we all talk about Credit Suez report, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think the government needs to, as the economy gets more advanced, at least start looking at data. Uh, then what we do with the data and how we communicate is a different issue. But we really need, need that data. So there, we're very lagging. Uh, on income inequality in general, we have done a great job as far as uh, trying to uh, raise the, uh, the lower income uh, through through post-subsidies or post-tax inequ 
tax inequality is quite low or uh, through progressive wage model and now the other tweaks that they're making with regard to uh, if you ha if you're going if a firm hires foreign workers then the minimum wage has to be a certain amount for local workers etc all that is positive uh, but like I said I don't think uh, it's an ev uh, it's an uh, ending situation my concern is really on the inequality side is really about the middle class not that I'm not concerned about low end, but I think, again, as a society matures, and there's always going to be a middle class no matter how high the income, but I think that middle class crunch uh, uh, is a tends to be a bigger issue in more advanced economies. The minister did say, well, they've, they've done a good job here in terms of ensuring that wages are not stagnant at the middle class level, etc. That's all true, but I think uh, the expectations of the middle class probably need to be uh, heard more and ironed out more. Again, no specific set of policies, but some, sometimes it's, it's useful. Just we talk about the lower end, then we talk about the wealth tax, but the middle class, I think that, that voice needs to be heard a bit more, uh, number one. Uh, so number two on demographics, as we have discussed, I mean, in terms of uh, they are probably, the government is probably doing as much it, as it can possibly do. You can't really change the demographics, I and mean, we can talk all you want about trying to provide incentives, unless you decide, to, unless you really decide, you decide that the real reason why TF uh, 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 fertility rates have been low and declining is because uh, you can't afford, given the education system, given other things in Singapore, the costs, etc., you have to, at some point in time, maybe when the kid reaches secondary school, one parent has to choose to stay at home, and, and so then, the costs become too high, and so that's the reason. Uh, so unless you're willing to go to uh, a, a Scandinavian type of system and provide a lot of other childcare, other types of benefits to see whether it would work in terms of reversing this, I'm not even suggesting it would work, but to see if you, uh, Unless you're willing to experiment with that, but the problem there is then the whole fiscal system has to change in terms of you, if you're going to incur all those expenditures, then you'll have to also get significant revenues, etc. So it's an experiment to try out, uh, but I'm not sure, uh, but that would require a complete change in philosophy. So as far as uh, leaving that aside, as far as demographics are concerned, I don't think there's very much more they can do except Think about raising the retirement age, trying to ensure that people's health is taken care of, uh, and also ensuring that people are more uh, able and clearer about how they can manage their retirement when it does happen. I think the last issue probably needs to, uh, there needs to be more work in that area. Whether it's the role of the government or, or uh, someone else, I don't know, but I think the last part is probably an issue for uh, uh, Singaporeans in terms of managing retirement when they do retire. Um, uh, emissions, if you don't mind, I'll leave it for my okay. two colleagues and I might come back to it later. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Kishan. Mm -hmm. I mean, These are daunting times. We're going through major disruptions worldwide. Um, people are anxious. And what I'm about to talk about is not just applicable to Singapore. It's probably applicable to many societies in the world that we have major deficits, deficits in trust. We don't really believe what the government tells us. We have desire for a more consultative democracy because people feel their voices are not being heard. Are being heard. And then there is this you know, perennial demand for greater transparency. Where is my tax dollar going? How is it being spent? And, and all of this is building upon this foundation of anxiety. We don't know whether our jobs are safe. We don't know if technology will displace us. We don't know if all the income and the fruits of these technological changes will only you know, concentrate at the very top five, ten percent, and everybody else will be left behind. So, what is the imperative to deal with this sort of you know plane or the avalanche of anxiety? It is again, you know, we we have a lot of technology that can enable us to create a more consultative form of democracy. So, these sort of conversations can be done in a far wider uh, uh, horizon, and and technology certainly allows it to happen even in the uh, uh, pandemic situation. In terms of transparency, I think your, your question that, you know, what are the scorecards? Uh, what is the milestone that a nation or a society is trying to reach? And it is not going to be about the number of jobs created or the industrial transformation that has taken place. That's for us to discuss on a forum like this. For the general public, I think it is just an intangible mood. If the mood of the nation is positive because prices are stable, jobs are plenty, um, things don't seem unaffordable because income is keeping pace, 
then the general mood itself will feed back into the way people comment on social media, the way people behave with each other, the way people demonstrate empathy. So I think a society where there is a great deal of information that is available to the public to understand where the government is coming from, to have a stake in the consultations that lead to decision making, I think would be a society that will be a healthier society than we have worldwide. Again, I'm not necessarily speaking in the context of Singapore, because I fear this is an issue all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that statement. Chris. I, I was taking a different approach when you, when you talk about measurements, right? So being an accountant and such. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I'll start with the first in terms of inequality. Um, I think we, we need to have some, I think there was a recent study, and I, I'm trying to recall where it was, where a household needs a certain income level. And I'm not suggesting minimum wage, but at least a certain income level to have a certain quality of life in terms of covering costs of education, health. And I think that should be set as a benchmark for us to mm. achieve for all our population. Mm. Everybody wants to be rich, sure, but can everybody at least achieve that minimum income level that you live with integrity, live with some comfort, and live safely? I think that, that would be a great way for us to start addressing the inequality. Mm. I also believe we need to focus on adding value. I think Minister touched on some statistics which were used just now in terms of the percentage, albeit not really increasing, of folks who are in the lower income bracket mm. who managed to, over the years, grow up, as they grew up, move into the higher income bracket. I think this concept of value adding is something which needs to be prevalent in our society. It is in many schools, um, the school I'm in. Um, we focus on not bringing in the best, highest PSLE scores, but we bring in people whom we fit into our school and we measure our success by what they get from the IB score. Because it's providing that value add, which is a measurement of what society does to bring out a person. And I think education is that great leveler. And coming back, finishing off with inequality on education, I think we need to focus on that upskilling, which Minister also talked about, mm -hmm. which is so very important. Because the one group I'm always concerned with when I look at it and I sit on my grab or I order my food is the gig economy. Mm -hmm. The gig economy is going to be replaced in many ways, mm -hmm. right? Through uh, autonomous vehicles, etc., robotics, etc. So, what is the skill? Teach everybody to fish. Hmm. Right. So that is a very important part. Okay. Let me come back to the part about um, uh, the emissions part. I'll just touch on it very briefly to say that I think we need to build on the fact that Singapore is a great opportunity to always be a showcase city. Hmm. Right. For years, people always talked about us being that clean and green. City, but we can be green in a really big way. Mm -hmm. And the government's moved down the right path, as we talked about earlier. Um, I really think that that will be a fantastic measure of emissions, mm -hmm. that we are going to be way ahead of the curve, not only in Asia, but maybe globally. Mm -hmm. and, and we're small enough to manage mm -hmm. it. I think there's a lot more which we can do and be the showcase, and in fact, build an economy around it. Lastly, I'll come back to, to the demographics. Longevity is, is something which we, are going to be, which we are already currently blessed with. Mm. But again, coming back to longevity, are, we, are many people living in an old age with dignity? Mm. I think there's a big question mark because unfortunately you still see many old people struggling on the streets and, and maybe you know, having to do certain jobs which you feel, ah, hang on, I wouldn't want my mom to do that or my dad to do that. Mm. So I think as a society, we need to focus on that to make sure that all our aged are looked after, especially healthcare. But we have to practice graciousness that some people may not have children to look after themselves again because of falling birth rates. We need to figure out a way to do that. Mm. And that will be then a measure of what kind of society we are. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks to all three of you for your very powerful statements, each of you. The, some key words and some key messages I take away from this that I'm going to go put in a spreadsheet at home to keep track of now going forward is uh, for Kishin, uh, you know, the sandwiched middle class is a group that we need to be very mindful of. They play a critical role in social cohesion generally, 
we have paid a lot of attention to those at the top of the income distribution, those at the bottom, the weak and vulnerable, but we can't neglect the sandwiched middle class uh, and, and it is they that hold society together. And that's something that we can certainly encourage greater conversation, greater uh, documentation, greater studies on. Uh, that helps us think about the, sort of intangible, the intangible spirit that Tamir referred to in the population. As you say, this is something, uh, th this general, uh, general mood of unrest is not unique to Singapore, far from it. It is worldwide. Uh, by some, some statistics that I was looking at, global unrest, however measured, today is four times the highest it's ever been for the last 70 years. For most of the modern era, as far as you know, th three generations can remember, even through the tumultuous 60s, mm. when there was the Vietnam War, civil rights, a whole range of other things in the United States and everywhere around the world, global unrest today is higher than it's ever been elsewhere. And that's something that I think, because this is something that's happening in every nation, including the worries and concerns in Singapore, that uh, we don't really have a good handle on yet, because it's different. Uh, it's happening in democracies, it's happening in non-democracies. It's happening in societies where income inequality is high, it's happening in societies where income inequality is low. There's a general peculiarity of this age. So technology has something to do with, social media perhaps, whole range of issues that we don't quite have a handle on. But the things that you point to, Tamir, have to do with information and transparency, helping people understand what we are all going through together is going to be very important. And, and Chris, your, your points, your, your, the, the issues you raise are very pointed. They have to do with uh, minimum income. The minimum, minimum income study that you're referring to, maybe let me just say something that did come out of researchers at the Lee Kuan Yew School and at Nanyang Technological University. And there's, as with all such studies, there's controversy about them. They might not have described it in quite the same way you did. It's true that they said minimum income study, but there are detractors from the research that's been done there that suggest that some of the things that went into their calculations are not what you would consider minimum income, but perhaps might be more towards the luxury end of the scale. In any case, it is an important point that we need to understand where the minimum is. It's no longer a dollar a day for the world. It has gone beyond that, and we need greater understanding of that. And to the extent that part of the work going forwards in, in actual fiscal changes, in actual communication of what's going on in Singapore, helps shed light on that issue in an informative, transparent way, that would be very helpful for how we, we go forwards. What you described as, as value added, I think might also be viewed as upwards mobility. That those, wherever you are in the income spectrum, you should continue to see hope going ahead. You should no, at no point feel that segments of society are forever beyond your reach. That you feel that uh, the way society has been constructed blocks you off from ever achieving that that other members of society are able to achieve. Is this opportunity upward mobility that we need to continue to build in? And that's an important marker, it seems to me, that we can put down as a scorecard. Uh, so this has been most valuable and enlightening. I want to leave the last word to each of you if you want to add anything to what we've said, but this has been a, a wonderful conversation. Any final points? No, I, I learned a lot from all of you. Thanks very much. My course. Thank you. Christopher, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Prof Kwa and panelists for this very rich and insightful uh, discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this event. On behalf of IPS, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all of the speakers and moderators for their time today. Thank you also to the audience for your active participation in the discussions. I hope that these are conversations that we will all continue having after today. Ladies and gentlemen, before you leave, please take a few minutes to complete our feedback form. You may access the form by scanning the QR code shown on the screen. Your feedback will go a long way in helping us improve our programs. Please be reminded that this roundtable has been recorded and will be available on the IPS website and on our YouTube page. Thank you very much again for joining us today and have a good afternoon. <laughs>